Okay, let me leave the uh, funeral. Okay, so welcome everybody to the uh, uh, May 20th uh, MNR MNRCC meeting. I'm glad that you're all here. And uh, so can I get a, I'll make a motion to approve the agenda for today. Do I get a second? Thank you, second. Francis. All right, uh, all in favor, aye. Aye. Approval of the minutes which was sent out. Make a motion to approve, second. Second. Thank you, all in favor, aye. aye. All, all right. right, chair's report was, um, was sent out. Um, so let me just bring, I have that here. I did have it here. Um, all right, so yeah, so open, let me see it. Oh. Okay, so, um, all right, so, um, as I said, we had a, the, I had a, um, a Zoom call this morning with uh, Metro's NOAA senior staff about, uh, about the, um, I, the running times which were increased and the, as I showed them in my, uh, uh, in my chair's report. And um, it's all due to a lot of work going on and um, they're going to, uh, you know, look to, to reduce it as, as projects wrap up. And that's just about the best information <laughs> that, that we have for, for right now on that. Um, that, that, that. That updates the report. So if there are any other questions about um, what's in there, uh, I'll be happy to answer them. Well, so Randy, did they indicate that uh, they plan to restore the, uh, or improve the running times as uh, the work permits them to do that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, there will be new timetables coming out, but they, um, new schedules don't affect what she wasn't at liberty to tell me what it was. They're still working on the details of that. And uh, I, I had a conversation recently with a um, person I know at uh, Hudson Link, which are those nice blue buses that go over replacing the Tappan Zee Bridge buses. And um, she informed me that they need a lot more than, you know, two weeks notice about this because they, they need, they actually need five weeks to prepare their, uh, all their computer things and the screens and that are in the streets and the buses and all the information they put out. And I reminded um, Kathy and her staff about that they, they need that length of time to do it. And uh, so she said, yes, she knew. So we'll see what happens there. But in the meantime, there is, um, uh, there's no change for the time being. I, and I didn't ask about printed copies of timetables. <laughs> I know there's a bane of some of our existence that they aren't doing it. <laughs> Um, Randy, um, I, and I had uh, been emailing with you this earlier. The um, does does Metro North generally uh, change their timetable for the summer? No, um, you know, the, no, the, no under, the old, under the old pre-pandemic stuff. Well, going back in history, Walter will agree it was always changed from um, standard time to Eastern to daylight saving time. And then when they went back the other way, April and October, March, maybe, but then they became, um, construction driven when there was some major construction project and they started putting them out. And now it's, it, it's now driven by increases in ridership. And they have, and they said that they have, um, they are seeing slowly an uptick in ridership, um, especially on the weekends. Thank you. Um, so we have a, uh, I, I, is there anything else on the, on the chair's report? Otherwise uh, I'll mention a board. We have a board briefing this afternoon and, um, let me see what that's, that's an email over here. So the usual things that we get is, uh, a COVID-19 and the security update, uh, the cyber security update, finance, procurement and uh, real estate. These are all topics that are going to uh, uh, come up at the next the Wednesday's board meeting. Um, I, I did see that it, there was, there's a, um, um, a mask force next Thursday. Um, so I'm gonna see if, how I can work it out so that I can I could go there and participate. Uh, Lisa, you've done a lot of them, haven't you? Yeah, they're, they're a lot of fun. Bradley's done them. 
as well. It's also the same day as our MN, as our I'm sorry as our transit New York City Transit Riders Council meeting. Um, for anyone who might be interested, um, uh, Dimitri um, Dimitri Critchlow will be our uh, speaker that day. And the link is on the website for that. Is that correct? It will it will be up. Uh, we're we're finalizing the agenda today. Yeah, I, I did. I, I participated in part of the LIRCC last week, and they had the, the MTA police chief there, and, and it was a rather interesting discussion. And, and very timely. Yes, yes, um, yes, it is. Okay, so that, that's really all I have there. Um, old business. The, the oh, I'm. I'm <laughs> There was supposed to be a White Plains dedication ceremony for this station, which never took place. It was canceled. So, uh, and I'm looking at you, Francis, and I'm saying that you, that you you indicated you might be interested to go. So I apologize for not telling you it was canceled. It just came like out of the out of the blue. So um, well, that's, that's all right. I I went down there anyway yesterday. They have a, a restaurant, the Dog Den, which is right next to the train station, which is incredible. So. I'll, I'll go back when you need me. I uh, thank you. I, I think there was some last minute details that somebody wasn't happy with that hadn't been addressed. And so uh, the thing got postponed. But then this week, uh, not, you're not blaming on things there. Lisa and the uh, executive committee were all were texting on from all day Sunday that there was, I'll, I'll let Lisa talk about it. Yes, because it, there's breaking news, actually. Oh, here's Oren. Okay. So I'll wait till Oren comes in, and then I'll and then I'll deliver the breaking news. Okay. Uh, Hi, Oren. Unmute Hi, Oren. yourself. Oren, you're muted. Hi, Oren. Hi, Oren. Hi. Okay. Um, so. So we, um, as you know, as Francina knows, as Francina was interviewed for the New York Times article on the topic, we have been working, um, oh, and I believe that Rich has joined us as well. All right. Great. Um, just writing this down. Uh, so we have been working um, at the urging of uh, Jerry Bringman, who's the chair of the LIRCC, uh, to advance the issue of uh, pre-tax transit benefits and people who have funds who that are, for lack of a better word, trapped in in those um, in those benefit funds. So you know, some um, friends, you know, you have several hundred dollars, I believe, in either wage works or transit check. Um, the way that the um, funds are structured is it's pre-tax <coughs> benefit, and if if you're not using transit. Um, you can't access those funds for anything else. There's no refund mechanism. So we're, we're, we've been trying for the past basically year to raise the profile on this issue and to see if there's any mechanism that can be put into place, regulatory fix for even a one-time amnesty to allow people who may have up to, you know, we've heard of people with almost $2,000 in the program to allow them to access these funds, pay taxes on them, um, and to use them for, uh, you know, rent, food, whatever else they may need them for. Also, if you uh, change your job um, or lose your job, you may not be, you, you may lose those funds also. So we've, we finally, we finally knocked on the right door and Senator Schumer is, um, is interested in pursuing this and has reached out to the IRS, who surprisingly couldn't understand why this was a, such a big issue and why people would have so much money, you know, trapped in these funds. Um, so we, you know, ex I've had several conversations with the senator's staff people and explained how this could happen. And we've been documenting people's cases. In fact, there's uh, um, somebody, Randy knows and, send, and several of you may know also um, do, do Len. There's somebody who we connected with Len Resto also, um, who came to us through the New York Times article uh, a fellow in New Jersey who has done a tremendous amount of work um, looking into the issue um, and is um, ha has even come up with some <laughs> language on some regulatory fixes um, of what could be done to to, um, to allow for um, at least a one-time fix here. 
So we were supposed to have a, a press conference last Monday at the Merrick train station in Long Island uh, that on Sunday evening was, was yanked unmercifully from us. Um, however, the new carrot has been dangled and looks like this coming Monday, Randy, at 11.30. Um, so uh, that is, it's being assembled um, as we speak. Um, I, uh, I know it's a, it's, it's a difficult time for all of us, um, but uh, I, I'm waiting for a confirmation from the Senator's staff person. Um, I'm sure you have meetings, et cetera, that have, are happening at I that have time. Too, but you know what, I, I, can, I could go out there and, 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 and do it from there. Right, and, and in fact, um, on our end, and, and this is actual good news, Bradley and I, bless you, Bradley, um, Bradley and I have um, interviews for an admin um, starting on Monday. So I will be out there bright and early at the Phoenix Diner on Merrick Boulevard um, doing conducting Zoom interviews uh, in advance of the press conference. Um, and Bradley will be delivering testimony on our behalf to the MTA board because we have to deliver it on Monday in advance of Wednesday's board meeting. Um, so as of as of today, that meeting is still uh, the press conference is happening on on um, Monday again. It's eleven o'clock, huh? Eleven thirty. Eleven thirty. Okay. Um, so uh, aside from this committee, but you guys decide who you think are candidates in the executive committee gets to choose, or is it out of our hands? Uh, at the um, no, so um, Bradley uh, has advised me because this is the first person I'm going to be able to hire is and, and I'm very excited um, first of two staff positions that we're interviewing for um, that the first round of interviews was with staff and then the second time um, second interviews uh, we bring in the executive committee. Okay. That's what I thought. All right. Thank you. Um, we've also gotten uh, permission to hire for uh, a, a research and communications associate uh, and um, we are waiting for the HR um, office to learn how to disentangle the um, cover letters, um, cover letter submissions to be able to send them to us um, because they've as of yet not figured out how to do that. So we've got the resume, but not the cover letters. And we've, those are both part of an application as far as we're concerned for a position that's writing heavy. Yeah. Just as background information for those who aren't familiar with the workings of the staff, they, they, we're not the two people. And you're looking, you look at you know, on my computer, Lisa's on the top left and Bradley's on the right, and I'm in the middle. So we're down to two people, and there's a lot of work that just needs to get done. Yeah. And uh, Andrew Albert was, um, who's currently the BCAC chair, uh, works tirelessly to get the um, to go back up the staff. So we're, we're making the first step toward that right so we're, we're we're thrilled we had been um we had literally walked into a room um where we had been hoping to pitch our case for a new position uh in march of last year uh and it was i think march 12th <clears throat> um and it, it was suggested that we just not even spend our time just turn around and walk out and we did, and packed up and went away for a year, basically. So it's, it's you know, we've made the case that it's, um, we can't meet our legislative mandate without additional staff. And um, they understood that. Yes. So we're, we're thrilled with that. So looking, for, looking forward to Monday at 1130 um, and then um, at, Merrick. Our, at Merrick and then our interviews. So okay. uh, since you have the floor, do you want to talk about the, uh, um, the addition that the LIRRCC -R -R got? Yes. The, the um, first one in three years. Yep. So the Long Island Railroad Commuter Council has a new member. So Walter, when you raised your hand before, I was thrilled because I thought maybe you knew something I didn't know. I'm afraid not. <laughs> We're still waiting, hanging in there. Okay. So the LIRRCC got its first new member. Uh, I, I, I knew before she did. Um, she Typical. is... Yeah, but she is really excited. She joined our meeting last uh, last week. Um, she is an avid rider. Um, she's back on the rails. 
She rides the Ronkonkoma line. She lives in Wyandanch. Um, she's been riding for the past 13 years. Um, she is uh, really excited. And uh, she had been nominated previously, but it got just lost because the Long Island Railroad Commuter Council's legislation is different than the other councils and that for each vacancy, there need to be three nominees. And so, uh, and I, I, I don't know why, um, but her, right. <laughs> her name is Christy Tolbert. Um, and so for, um, so her name had been previously sent up, but then the council, the, the uh, county executive had to um, also send up other names. And they, so they've sent up six names. We're waiting for the other person. Now we have an, an additional vacancy since uh, Sheila Carpenter, who is another member from Suffolk County has left. And I continue to follow up with Nassau County there um, and to follow up certainly with the governor's appointments office. Um, to see about any traction for this council. Um, I had, uh, you know, we do have one, our vacancy on the MTA board also for uh, the uh, Long Island Railroad Commuter Council and the legislative session is coming to a close very soon. So we've been, Jerry Bringman and I have sort of been doing an all court press on that, uh, reaching out to our contacts at the governor's office, reaching out to our contacts in the Senate. Um, and this morning he was advised that he has a, um, a Zoom interview with the governor's appointments office on oh, Monday morning. So um, I'm hoping that, you know, there's a lot of doors that's been, that we've been knocking on, um, or maybe, uh, you know, that what I've heard from Senator Comrie's office is that their rumor mill was that a flurry of appointments would be coming before the Senate, um, before the end of session, so. See, well, I guess, which is the way that usually is. Yeah, Walter is in a different position because he doesn't need to have that two minutes of you. When did you say that? When did you submit your uh, papers to the state? It was before you went to Florida, wasn't it? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, I can't remember. I don't have them in front of me, but uh, it was quite a was March. Ago, I think maybe in January or February. January, February. We had a PCAC meeting in December. So it was after that, January, right, January or February. We had a, a PCAC meeting in March, so it was before then. So it's either February or January. And I did get one question, one or two questions in my email from people in the governor's appointments office asking questions which I answered, and I've heard nothing since then. Those questions came oh, mid-April. Uh, I had, um, well, hopefully they're pursuing that. I mean, you don't have to go through Senate confirmation, so there's no... Okay. Um, you know, time timeline that is as urgent as um, you know getting the board seated, board position seated. Um, the uh, I did have a conversation with Wilhelm Ronda, who was recommended by the Bronx Borough President, and he has a number of personal um, situational issues that he was hoping he could at this point withdraw his name from consideration. Um, I asked him to please just fill out the paperwork since there, there's a great likelihood that um, there will be a new borough president seated before anything happens. So, but at least we could get the ball, the, the ball rolling. Um, he was with us for a very, very short time, but he was really interested yeah. in enjoying, enjoyed being with us. Yeah, he's, he's terrific. I mean, he's extremely knowledgeable. Um, I mean, particularly with the um, pen access coming online, but um, we should probably start broadly paying attention to the Bronxboro president races. I know that some of the council races are very focused on uh, pen access also. So, well, since but, you talked, brought up pen access, uh, Walter, why don't you ask Lisa that question? Maybe she knows more what you asked about getting, getting the, um, being able to see it in, a, in Westchester County, the presentation. You emailed me yesterday. What, what, what was that, Randy? You wanted to, get, you wanted to know if there were places yeah. in Westchester or in the Bronx where people could go and make the comments about the pen access. Oh, yes, yes. And I did see uh, there's a flash drive you can get uh, upon request. So I'm going to request the flash drive. But I could see the whole, the whole no, thing can be downloaded if you want to. It's all on there and you can read it. It's a huge document, to put it mildly. So there, there is an email that we got um, that is 
uh, that I can certainly send everybody here um, that says there is a notice of availability for the environmental assessment and draft section 4F evaluation for the MTA Metro North Penn, Ac Penn Station Access Project. Electronic copies can be found at uh, a link which is included in this email and hard copies are available. Comments can be submitted no later than July 3rd. The MTA is hosting a public meeting on June 15th from 6 to 8 to receive comments related to the EA and the draft section for F evaluation. Uh, this public meeting will be conducted as a virtual public meeting. And then there are uh, meeting notices in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different languages. Um, I will send this email out to everybody so that, um, so that you have it. Um, and uh, I, I would think that it would make sense for us to submit comments. So we'll, we'll develop those before, um, before the July 3rd deadline. All right. There's also, um, you know, at the same time, there is a lot of hyperbole and rigmarole, if those are technical terms, surrounding uh, Penn Station expansion um, that uh, have to do with um, two different aspects of the project. One is the expansion of, of the uh, Penn Station South, which would, which is part of the Gateway project, and would allow for eight additional tracks, uh, some of which would be used for Metro North uh, for the Penn Access project, um, and some largely would be used by Amtrak and New Jersey New Jersey Transit. In the presentation that was made at the MTA board, it showed that the percentage of trains going in to uh, into Penn Station that are Long Island Railroad and, um, and uh, Metro North increased compared to the other two, uh, it, it compared to Amtrak and Metro North, but that the numbers of people traveling on those two uh, systems would increase. Um, the other, and, and that $1.3 billion, Peter, please correct me if I'm, if I'm aside from the words hyperbole and rigmarole, um, if, I'm, if I'm wrong on any of these details that you're aware of, uh, $1.3 billion was um, approved in this, uh, in the budget for this year for that project. Um, and, the, and the MTA and the governor's office are seeking support um, for those aspects of, of the project, particularly um, because they could lead to uh, additional benefits for uh, you know, for, for West of Hudson Riders and for, and for others. Um, the other aspect that you may have heard a lot about is uh, development to the east of Penn Station, which would be taking of a number of blocks to the east um, and development of a number of different high rises. And that's where a lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, negative, community input has come into play from people who have, um, who, who have expressed concern that that's outside of a transportation planning aspect and, and is outside of the state's um, realm of responsibility and takes the city out of any transportation, out of any planning um, process. Uh, and in fact, that was part of the um, way that the um, that the budgetary language had been written was that it would be a fully a state process and remove the city. So there's some legislation that's being discussed by Senator Hoyleman, who's running for Manhattan Borough President, uh, that would um, allow for city processes to be reintroduced there. So a lot of politics, a lot of process. Um, and basically, you know, I would think that the main goal should be tra best transportation system and network possible. Thank you. I, I have, um, uh, since I've been vaccinated and uh, I've decided to start riding the trains again, although I, I was used to arrange these groups of five, six, seven, eight people. I'm not doing that right now. And so in the spur of the moment, I decided to call a friend who was, had expressed interest in riding out to Hackettstown, New Jersey, uh, mile post 57. So we did that yesterday and encountered 
very, very friendly crews. Uh, we told them, well, I told them who I was, and, and of course, they're all forthcoming to give me information on things that should be done to improve service, which I, I'm happy to hear. And I found out about uh, one train on Rich, Richard's line there, train number 49, which leaves um, to something out of, um, out of Hoboken, and it goes up to Middletown, and then it goes back as an equipment train, which means it doesn't carry passengers. And uh, he said, uh, you know, why, why, why don't we take passengers back? So I raised that issue this morning, and uh, Kathy Rinaldi said she will discuss it with New Jersey Transit. Uh, I, I cited as an example that many years ago, uh, the Long Island Railroad, this, uh, under, um, well, they thought about it they, and they agreed to do it. They ran a, they call it Jura train to get people from, who would connect at Ronkonkoma to the courthouse for jury service at Riverhead. And uh, so they, they did, they put it in, but the train ran back without picking up passengers. And so Bill Henderson was here then, and a friend of mine who lived out there, and, and you know, urged the creation of that train. Um, lobby. He even went to the railroad's offices in Jamaica on his own time to lobby for this, and they agreed to to do it. So the train um, did um, pick up passengers, but there was no connection to New York. You had to wait like 40 minutes or something like that for a train to New York, but they did do it. And so I saw this as an, as, as an example of they should do it. And I said, don't make every single stop because I know the train has to turn for something, but please, you know, put it in there. And, and so anyway, she said, they'll, they'll talk to NJ Transit about it. I will keep up on it because I, I you know, watch the schedules. So um, is there anything else that uh, anybody, any new business that anybody has? Uh, is anything else? Yeah, Randy? Yes. Yeah, it's Rich. Go ahead. Um, you know, I'm on the village Woodbury board. Okay. And, uh, there's been a lot of activity of hotel chains buying up properties around the commons like Marriott, Hilton, uh, comfort suites. There are six applications to build hotels and there's rumors. Uh, that's why I want to know if you heard anything. The Catskill resort gaming thing. It's been a failing business since day one. Which one was this? And the, the, the Catskill Resort Gate uh, Casino. Oh, okay. Is a failing business. <coughs> a failing <coughs> business. Okay. <coughs> and there's rumors the guy that owns Harriman Train Station <coughs> adjacent property, uh, it was <coughs> in the para. Um, he might sell to a casino, um, be, be, and uh, we're trying to find out what's going on. I was wondering, have you heard anything? I have not, but uh, one, one, you know, when you were talking about all these hotels building there, um, Oren is active for a long time in pushing Metro North to uh, build the better station, build a station, right, at the... Um, Woodbury Commons, and that could, uh, it would be, well, do you want to talk about it, Warren? Well, um, originally that was on the uh, uh, governor's plan to build a train station at Woodbury Common, and the uh, Port Jervis line goes right past Woodbury Common, so it would be a, a great idea to build a station there. Traffic around there is, well, I don't know about now, but I know it used to be horrible. Uh, it is. Just getting on to terrible Route 32. Do we, uh, can we find out if anything is still, if that's still a, a plan, Lisa, uh, of the governor's to, to do a train station there? Because if he wants it, he's going he's gonna to get it done. <laughs> well, it, would, it would be in the MTA's capital program. Oh, I don't think it is. Is it? Is it? Uh, we would have to look. Um, but we can also... We'll ask. We'll, we'll look and we'll ask. Okay. Oh, wait, we have someone from Metro North. Peter, do you have any idea? Can you look it up quickly? You have access to um, to the uh, all the information at Metro North? Peter? You're muted. Oh. I don't know. 
he, he may have stepped away. Uh, well, I'll, I'll check it out. Okay. Thanks, Lisa. Oh yeah, it would be it would be a great a great project. I know Metro North wasn't really hot to trot on it because they spent all that money building that huge parking lot down at Harriman, but uh, you know th this one doesn't have to have a lot of parking. <laughs> I mean, it already has, but it would be a, a really a great um, a great uh, benefit. Well, back in 2001, I think it was Metro North devoted a great deal of time and energy to this project. We negotiated a deal with the Woodbury Common folks. It was a very difficult negotiation. Uh, we made a lot of plans for that station and uh, sort of uh, toward the end of the, well, it was the end when the town of Woodbury said they wouldn't allow it. Uh, the, the problem was, well, the initial problem was on, uh, I guess it was Black Friday in 2001, the Woodbury Common owners or operators uh, didn't have enough security guards or traffic officers on hand because it was right after 9-11 and they didn't think many people would come to go shopping on Black Friday that year. And what happened was a lot of people came and the parking lot was total gridlock. There were stories that it took three hours for some people to get out of the lot. And so the town said, no, we don't want a railroad station here. It's your traffic will be a nightmare and we're not allowing any building around here. And of course, if you go there today, you see they've done lots of building around there of all sorts of facilities since 2001. But a lot of effort went into that project and we thought it was a very good project. So if it can be revived and if the governor would support it, that would be great. Well, uh, you didn't hear they were gonna bring auto train up there. <laughs> no, I did that. <laughs> that might've worked, that might've been a good way out. <laughs> That's one way they would have cars there, but if they come by train, you don't have a car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. So I just looked, <laughs> excuse me, I just looked through the capital program really quick, and I don't see anything about the Woodbury Common Station in the capital program whatsoever, but it doesn't mean that it's not there. It's just in the document. It's not under the, the station section. Okay. Appreciate you checking that. Yeah. All right. I did see that the um, that the regional economic development um, councils are, are reigniting. So that could even be something that they propose or you know uh, a project that they, that they look at i mean that's outside of their funding and certainly but um you know, it, if it's if it's you know something we'll, we'll we'll look into it also all right thanks lisa sure thanks all right so um i don't have anything else so if any if, uh, just say that the next time we should all we should all get together is june 3rd for the PCAC meeting. Uh, the announcements will be sent out. Yes, Walter? Yeah, I'd like to just ask a couple questions. If, sure. Does anybody know, has it been disclosed anywhere, uh, if MTA has an agreement with Amtrak to use the railroad between New Rochelle Junction and uh, Harold? Is your picture there? Why? Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, um, Walter, can you say that again, please? Yeah, is it known, is it public, what, whether and whether Metro North, not Metro North, MTA or Metro North have reached agreement with Amtrak regarding the use of the Amtrak owned railroad between New Rochelle Junction and uh, Harold Interlocking down in Long Island City? Is, is that regarding the um, Penn Access? Yes, exactly. Um, it, I don't know um, that it might say that in the um, in the documents. Yeah, we'll take a look for that yeah. because <laughs> I have a lot of experience dealing with Amtrak over the years, and they have a lot of they have a a bad habit of changing all the rules of the game at the last minute, <laughs> and uh, that can lead to very unfortunate consequences. I think that, so one of the things that the governor has talked about um, in, in, in his announcement um, of, of not just Penn Access, but in um, other other projects that have related to Amtrak has been, well, look who was the president, you know, a year ago, and now look who's the president. And, you know, there's a very different tenor in Washington. Well, that's true, but that doesn't mean that the bureaucracy of a large agency changes overnight, even if the administration um, and its direction do. 
Yeah, I would think all of that would make Amtrak more reasonable to deal with today. Uh, but uh, I know they have a way of doing things that uh, unless the very top people have seen and approved something, as far as some of them are concerned, it's a whole new ball game. When they get to look at it for the first time and say, wait a minute, they raise all sorts of issues that usually end up costing a lot of money to somebody else or to somebody other than Amtrak. I think Jan Jano has been very good at getting getting things out of Amtrak. Good. Uh, if, he, if he came over to see you. Now, while you mentioned that, something else um, just came to my mind. I got a, an email from a friend of mine about the, the Pen Access project. And <coughs> it turns out that the M8s, even though they uh, get, take their power from an overhead, from the catenary, um, and of course they can operate on the underrunning third rail of Metro North to get into GCT, they can't use the catenary in the Penn Station area because it's 25 kV. And to, to make, uh, as he, he said that in order for them to be capable of running on the kV, uh, the 25, they have to do something which would add a lot of weight to the cars. So he said they have to put a third rail from gate interlocking to get through into, um, into a Penn Station. So it's not because they have the overhead is there, it's, not, it's the wrong power source. I wonder if the B moves would be helpful in that um, the dual modes that they're looking at for the Long Island Railroad. Um, I, I want to tell you that friends of mine who have familiarity with the project are not happy with it. <laughs> well, they haven't even with the B moves or the, um, but they haven't even started that yet. They, the people I, I speak to who have contacted me have told me they're not happy about it. It's not, right. but it's not workable. So I mean, I can't, I can't say anything more than that. Right. I'd be interested to know more offline, just since it's, yeah. Sensitive. <laughs> All right. So anyway. One more, one more thing. Sure. Uh, the issue of printing timetables, uh, I can understand during the situation as it is now with it, the service is evolving and gradually changing over a period of time that they don't want to print timetables. But I hope we can keep this in the sort of the front burner or very close to the front burner that we should not give up on the issue of getting printing time, printed timetables for the long term. That should be an objective. And once things are pretty much stabilized, uh, I really think that railroads should go out and print timetables once again. Well, yeah, the, well, you know, the, the, the time period really is irrelevant because the Long Island Railroad regularly is issuing the whole set of timetables every couple of weeks when they made a change. Uh, I, I wasn't going to talk about it, but since you brought it up, uh, I did send an email to Metro North. The uh, current um, timetables that they post on their website uh, for the service, for the, are, um, I, they should look like the Long Island Railroad timetables uh, that the Long Island Railroad post on their website, meaning it's a complete timetable. It has all the information on there, all the connections, all of the fares and all the special instructions. And, and it's like you could just click a button, send it to a printer and you print the copy for yourself. The one that's Metro North is just simply the, the schedule itself. And I wrote in my words to, to the person I sent it to. I, I don't want to be insulting, but it just doesn't look very professional. And, and it's they, very fine they, print. You can't even read it. I'm writing the Harlem line tomorrow and I get the timetable and I have to blow it up and print out a small portion of the timetable in order to know what trains I can take because uh, just sitting there looking at it, the way it comes out on the screen, I can't possibly read those numbers. But they want you. They want you to use the app. <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> <but they want. laughs> right? What did, you, what did you, 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 and the other guys used to say that uh, if if uh, Amtrak doesn't print timetables because they said if if you can't look it up, they don't want you as a. Is that what you said? Yeah. Well, you won't know how late the train was. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, yeah, they want you to use the apps for that. So we have June 3rd for PCAC and then July 15th, it will be our one summer meeting. So I uh, hope to see you all then. And June 3rd, okay. um, June 3rd will be when PCAC next its, elects its next chair. That's right, yes, it's not me. I just finished three years and now six years, six years ago, it's, it's 23rd, 2017, I finished mine. So okay. we have elections for PCAC next month. 
All right, if anybody, has, does anyone else have anything? No. Make a motion to adjourn. I vote to adjourn. Second. And, and, and I thank you all for participating today. We had a 100% attendance, that's great. All right, thank you. 100% See you all, 100, yeah, 110 yeah, That's right, well, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye all.